All right, everyone, welcome to our education equity webinar um, for youth for education. So some quick introductions. Um, first, the National Youth Leadership Council, or NYLC. It is a service learning organization. So it basically um, helps schools and organizations across the country implement service learning into their curriculums and into their after school activities. They're currently par partnering with NHTSA um, to do a project ignition program about teen driver safety and working on after school service learning. And what we are is the Youth Advisory Council. So we help out with NYLC's annual conference, the National Service Learning Conference, highly recommend. Um, and we help lead Youth for Ed. Youth for Education is a program that is kind of a nationwide push for education equity through community-based service learning. Um, and you'll learn a lot more about it throughout this webinar, but let's get started. So what is service learning, Zara? Service learning is an approach to teaching and learning in which students use academic knowledge and skills to address genuine community needs. But it's also a way for students to take an active role in the events happening within their own communities and to make meaningful change about them. So um, with the NYLC, we have some norms that we want to extend to you throughout this webinar, and we hope that you'll extend back to us. And part of that is staying engaged, um, so participating, uh, listening generously, and really taking in what we have to share with you, speaking your truth, and experiencing discomfort. So our goals for the webinar today are first for you to understand our interpretation of the history of education and kind of how it got so inequitable. And there are other ways to see this, but we're trying to provide kind of the basic facts in our interpretation. Um, feel free to do your own research. It's really interesting and really important to understand as the fundamental of all service learning, education, and the fight for education equity. Um, we also hope that you can kind of see how education equity plays a role in your community, whether your community is inequitable, and kind of what you wanna see out of that. What is your ideal situation of education equity? Um, and finally, we wanna explore our whys. So why we do service learning and why we care about education equity. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that um, and why later. So one of the first things that we want to talk about is what is your why? And here we have an incredible quote from Simon Sinek on what your why can be. So uh, I'm just going to read a part of it. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Sometimes you know how they do it. Some, some know how they do it, but very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And why, I don't mean to make a profit. I mean, what's your purpose? What's your belief? Why do you get out? In, what did, why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? So we want you to share your why with us. Um, why does? Why are you here? Why do you want to be engaged with service learning? What um, fuels you to get out of the bed in the morning? And why should people care? So. We'll kind of start by sharing our why, so why we work on Youth for Ed, and why we care so much about education equity, and sort of our as a program. So our first expected outcome why um, is to create brave spaces for vulnerable discussion. So we need to create a place where everyone feels comfortable talking about their experiences and what they want to see in the world, um, and where people feel comfortable kind of challenging themselves and what they've learned in the past. Um, our second why is to improve school climate. Um, with Youth for Education, students will bridge gaps between each other, their teachers, and their administration, whether racial, economic, or otherwise. And they will work to have education recognized as a two-way process. Uh, another, our third reason is we want to uh, create meaningful change through service projects, and we want to uh, take action turn that discussion that we talked about before into action. Uh, we want students to help their friends and family and greater community to understand the issues that are important to them. And through Youth for Education, we want to provide them with resources 
uh, so they'll have the tools and guidance required to sit at the table with their school administration and talk about the issues that are important to them and to create a plan of action on how to address them. And our final why is to foster positive youth adult partnerships. So this is basically a relationship where the youth takes initiative. They say they want to do a project, want to start a program, want to participate in something. And then within that project, usually within our context of service learning, there's shared decision making between young people and adults. So this means that young people are bringing their ideas, their aspirations, their boldness and creativity, and adults often have the resources and the experience to kind of make it happen. So we believe that this is the most effective and sustainable partnership and the way to make real change. So I hosted a, a webinar about youth adult partnerships with the wonderful NYLC staff member, Maddie. It was a prime example of a good youth adult partnership. Um, it is on the Service Learning Network and I would definitely check it out. So briefly, the history of education equity. This is kind of why we do what we do um, and how we got to this place. And that'll kind of inform how we move forward. So we're gonna start way back in the 1800s. And um, in the early 1800s, the constitution didn't specifically assign education to the federal government. So that responsibility was brought to the states and states really didn't want to tax the people uh, at such an early stage in the country's development. So they pushed that onto local governments. And if they wanted to, they could collect taxes for education. And uh, what resulted from all of that was really inform a really informal schooling system that was often based in religion and which prompted Joseph Lang Lancaster to come from Britain to Massachusetts to set up the Lancaster or as it will become known later on is the monitorial system uh, and in the post-civil war uh, 1800s during reconstruction um, there was a great opportunity to diversify schooling with the um, with four million people being released uh, from slavery but black codes which would later be known as Jim Crow laws and plus E.B. Ferguson in 1896 prevented that and along with that um, as the uh, American dream expanded westwards uh, there was the forming of forced Native American boarding schools, which used the monitorial system that was created by Joseph Lancaster to, quote, kill the Indian. So moving into the 1900s, you can already see kind of clear racism and how it impacted schooling. Um, but in the 1900s, what happened was sort of a legislation of these tendencies. So first of all, in the 1900s, it became very clear um, that the federal government was oppressing black and brown people, mostly black people, through a myriad of systems. So most importantly, I would say, is housing. They prevented black people from buying homes with government mortgages, and they kind of forced them to live in communities by themselves um, at really high interest rates, mortgage rates. So they created kind of very economically unstable, unsafe, kind of desperate, um, what we would call ghettos because it is a kind of politically imposed um, isolation of a singular group. So there were black people living in these communities and schools that were built there were not given resources by the state um, and were kind of left to deteriorate while schools in white communities were given new teachers, new textbooks, new pedagogies to teach with um, and parents themselves had more resources for teaching their students um, and for and this gap really grew so that's the basis of how education got so segregated in 1954 um, the brown versus board of ed decision was um, was taken by the supreme court and they decided that separate but equal facilities were not possible this could not exist and schools had to be integrated but this is really what happened um, it's partly because Supreme Court decisions are hard to implement, but also because the U.S. has been really unwilling to make our education system more equitable. In the Civil Rights Act, about 10 years later, um, there were also clauses about education, um, about the need for integration and kind of the socioeconomic and emotional impacts that integration has. And so this is why it didn't really happen. So we see in the 1970s, 1990s, up until now, um, this means that white students are performing at a far higher level than black and brown. And that is no fault of their own. There's no racial difference between them. It's 
kind of this different resources and this intent um, of the government to oppress black people that has kind of kept them at a lower academic level um, and continued the cycle of racism. And that's gone on until now. Um, but more specifically, Bella will talk about the 2000s. All right, so in the 2000s, although racial segregation is still a major issue in our education system today, um, the legislation that's being passed is more focused on children with disabilities, um, children living below the poverty line, and children that are a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so in 2001, the No Child Left Behind Act was passed. Um, it required states to develop their own assessments to measure student success. It was developed as an accountability system for school districts. Students with disabilities were finally able to utilize certain modifications that were clear in their IEPs on state assessments. Though some were excited with, that students with disabilities were included in the standardized assessments, others worried that too much focus was placed on passing the test itself. Um, but at its core, the No Child Left Behind Act was passed to ensure that all children have a fair, equal, and significant opportunity to obtain a high quality education. Um, in 2002, uh, the President's Commission Report, Revitalizing Special Education for Children and Their Families was passed. Um, it was passed because children with disabilities need highly qualified teachers who work to educate each child. It was a more of a focus on results, not on process mentality. Um, because schools needed to consider children with disabilities as general education children first. Um, in 2015, a free community college plan was proposed. Um, President Obama proposed this to provide two free years of community college to all Americans. If the plan was to be approved, students could receive their education as long as he or she attends school at least half time, maintains a roughly C plus average, and is on track to complete their program or transfer to a four year school. Although this plan is still just a proposal, the idea of free higher education for all Americans is promising for future students. And in 2016, the Obama administration told students they must allow transgender students to use bathrooms matching their gender identity. The goal of this directive was to provide equity to transgender students, but many argued that this violates the rights of non-transgender students, especially in situations such as the locker room. Although faced with losing federal funding, many states chose to disregard the directive and sued the, the Obama administration over it. So as we can see, education equity kind of tackles a bunch of different sectors of life um, and oppresses multiple different identities. So however you think that affects your community, however it's affected you personally, that's what we invite you to tackle. So, um, I go, I live in Prior Lake, Minnesota, and we are a very small suburban town, but we have a very high education level. We were in Newsweek's uh, top 500 schools, um, and Prior Lake was uh, previously na uh, Native American Dakota Sioux land. Uh, we had one of the highest concentrations of Native American people in the early 1900s, um, and up to the late uh, 1960s, most of our education was done by boarding to nearby uh, cities like Farmington and Shakopee. Um, and in those cities and in Prior Lake, we've had very consistent population demographics with over 90% uh, white people, which feeds into the larger misconceptions about other minorities. And it creates a giant feedback loop where there's a bunch of misinformation about minorities and they go into society with those misconceptions and then they come back to sort of the safe bubble of uh, of majority white community where their ideas are echoed back at them. Um, and so when uh, students like me who are black and Muslim come into this um, sort of community, there is a complete lack of preparedness to accommodate students of different races and cultures, uh, despite Minnesota's open enrollment policy, which has led to a lot of tension between cultures and through Youth for Education, we hope to uh, address that issue. All right, so <clears throat> I live in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, in 1784, Clarksville was established near the confluence of the Cumberland and Red Rivers. Clarksville quickly expanded and the first school, the Roll Academy, was created in 1806. Now, Clarksville School District includes eight high schools, seven middle schools, and 24 elementary schools. Clarksville is a somewhat large urban city, 
So there are bound to be parts of town that are quote unquote better than others. For example, there are two government funded public housing complexes in Clarksville, Lincoln Homes and Summit Heights. Both of these communities, often called the projects, have become a hub for seeding crime and perpetuating poverty. These projects also feed almost entirely into some of our schools, giving them a bad reputation. But it isn't the poor child's fault, it's the school districts. One of our good schools is ranked as number 16 out of the entire state, while one of our bad schools is ranked as number 92 out of the entire state. The problem are financially challenged students. The Clarkson Montgomery County School District claims to have a mission to educate and empower students to reach their full potential. This mission leads many to wonder if some students have more potential than others. The school district in Clarksville is, and always has been, one that has excelled academically and is very diverse, but we do have a very long way to go. And I live in New York City, um, so I have a few statistics here that you can take a look at. But the basics are that New York City has over 1,700 schools in it that serve 1.1 million students. So that's an insane amount of students. Um, and I think our problem goes back maybe 100 years. Um, but right now what we're tackling is that there's inequitable enrollment. So there are screen schools, which means that there's very specific selection. So when you graduate middle school, instead of going to your local middle school, uh, local high school, um, there's an application process. So you rank 12 schools, one to 12, um, and see where you get in. If you don't get in, there is a zoned school, but these often correlate very closely with resources, wealth, and race. So I go to which is one of the most affluent and one of the whitest schools in New York City. And this is because admissions are very targeted towards white affluent students. And it's not even conscious racism. I think the problem is sometimes so internalized and so subconscious that people don't realize um, that like very basic resource um, differentials and kind of inherent privileges come out in the high school process. So this means that my school is getting more money from a wealthier PTA than another school. It means that we have newer textbooks, a prettier building, more resources for sports teams, and more classes than a school in, say, the Bronx or Upper Manhattan. Um, this leads to extreme racial differences. So if you can see right here on the right, um, Asian and white students receive far more diplomas than Black and Hispanic students. And again, this is not because Black and Hispanic students are inferior. It's because they're not receiving the same resources and historically they've been oppressed by the system. You can see all of these statistics show that New York City is extremely segregated and because of that, um, certain racial groups are oppressed by the system. So what we're working to do is take, oh, I mean, we'll go into this later, but um, kind of get, eliminate the screen so that students have access to any school and any courses um, and all of the resources that New York City has to offer, and so that everything becomes a little bit more equal and everyone gets the resources that they need to do the best that they can. But how does education inequity manifest itself in your community? Share in the chat box or just take a few minutes to think about it, because um, there are multiple ways that it can pop up in your community. But whatever matters most to you, why you care about this webinar, why you're here, um, take a few minutes to think about that. All right, so wondering about education inequity and kind of coming to a conclusion of thinking, is there a solution? There is. It's Youth for Education. So what is Youth for Ed? It's a youth-led movement to advance education equity through service learning. Um, our website is nylc.org slash page slash youth for education. Um, so youth for education began because young people and their adult allies should join together to raise awareness on issues of education equity in their schools and community. Lead activists form youth for education clubs that cultivate action. NYLC staff and youth advisory council members provide support and a network for the clubs from across the country and around the world. Some students will have the opportunity to attend NYLT, a social justice focused training camp powering a generation of leaders. 
So go ahead and visit our website to learn more about youth for education and becoming a lead activist. So how can you get involved? Students can become lead activists. Adults can become an adult sponsor or encourage a student to become a lead activist. Or if you're so inclined, you can join the Youth Advisory Council. So um, lead activists receive support from NYLC throughout the year as they develop a service learning project centered around education equity. Lead activists are expected to serve a one-year term spearheading education equity in their communities with the support of an adult sponsor. Over the course of this year, lead activists will partake in professional development hosted by and, report, or hosted by and reported quarterly to the, youth, the NYLC Youth Advisory Council. Adult sponsors are teachers, counselors, or community leaders who are passionate about education equity and are willing to support a youth lead activist. Um, and if you want to join the Youth Advisory Council, we are a group of young servant leaders that are visioning for us behind youth for education. We advise NYLC on the direction of the campaign professional development and plantation to the national conference and serve as NYLC representatives at the conference. Each YAC term lasts two term lasts two years. The current cohort has served since 2019 and we will continue until 2021. So thank you for coming to our webinar. Um, we hope you learned about education equity and are excited to kind of create it within your own community. Um, if you feel so inclined, you can fill out this form to tell us about the webinar. And that also has some more information about how you can join Youth for Ed. But thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful day.